Felicia Cox, October 21st, 2017. My name is Felicia. I live with my son in a twice-mortgaged, three-bedroom house at the foot of Verdugo Hills in Glendale, California. The floors are treated hardwood, the furnishings are vintage, and lush rose bushes flourish in the backyard. But since the day I walked through the door and tripped over the blocks, the place never again felt like home. My son's name is Benjamin. He's two years old, soft and adorably pudgy, with dumpling cheeks and a square jaw. His skin is several shades darker than mine, colored like his Nigerian grandmother, but his large, deep-set eyes are gray and expressive in a manner reminiscent of my own mother's. These days, monster stories define my life. Stories of women with snakes for hair, women with mouths in the back of their heads, women that turn into bats and horses and sea creatures, men who turn into wolves and coyotes, dogs with the faces of men. Demons that must be summoned, lost spirits confined for eternity to bridges and graveyards and forgotten old manners. Monsters play by rules. Vampires must be invited inside. The Sphinx can't hurt you if you answer her riddle. Werewolves are restricted by the full moon. Never feed a gremlin after midnight. If you play fair, if you mind the boundaries between what is human... Coexistence is possible, but if you cross the barrier, intentionally or otherwise, well, it's best you keep on hand a rosary and a loaded revolver. You must remember me. A creature has been following me my whole life. No matter how far I run, no matter how many times I try and start over, it always finds me. It can start fires. It can make things appear and disappear, and it always takes the form of a child. Its true image is only visible when it is captured on film. It tormented my late mother to near insanity. It drove my father to suicide. And it's destroyed any hope I've ever had of a normal life. It killed my brother. Now it wants my little boy. Six months ago, I buried my husband. I could try and blame the thing for Isaiah's death, but that's a hard sell. It does tend to bring misfortune whenever it comes around. Even so, the lion's share of culpability for my untimely widowhood can be squarely pinned to the asshole who plowed over my husband like a speed bump and left him to bleed out in a Linwood gutter. They still haven't caught the guy. The cops tell me they're looking, but I shouldn't hold my breath. There were no witnesses, and it's not like they're going to find fingerprints. The driver was probably drunk. He had to be going at least 20 miles over the speed limit, judging by how far Isaiah was thrown. Isaiah had only stopped to get a sandwich at Ralph's on the way home from a marketing convention. It bothers me, the randomness. All it took was a fraction of a second to erase him from my life forever. To take him away from our son. Five days after Isaiah's funeral, it left me the blocks. The in-laws had departed that afternoon. Leaning over the barrier at Bob Hope Airport, they assured me one last time. Benjamin and I were welcome to stay with them in Oakland if our big house were to seem too lonely. Maybe. I woke around 3 a.m., drenched in sweat from a nightmare I didn't remember. Something was dancing with flames and a cacophony of screams. I was struck by just how silent the house was, now that the robust stream of house guests, relatives, and friends, and assorted well-wishers bearing condolences and food had dried up. I plodded down the hallway to Benjamin's room. My son was peacefully asleep, moonlight streaming through the blinds casting pale lines of light over his small body. God, he was a beautiful child. 
For the first time since I'd gotten the call from Long Beach PD, I saw beyond my shock and grief and focused on everything I had to worry about. Isaiah and I bought the house anticipating two incomes and a big family. Now, neither would be a possibility. The house had been a little out of our price range, but it was so pretty. The charming French farmhouse at the end of the manicured, magnolia-lined block on a hill. Purple mountains rising in the distance. And in the end, we crossed our fingers and went for it. I was making good money as a senior accountant with PwC, and Isaiah insisted he and his partners would sell the company he co-owned, Royal Bash Marketing, within the year, netting him a seven-figure windfall. And then the prospective buyout fell through, then fell through again. I quit my 60-hour-a-week job when Benjamin was born and took a position at a mid-sized business management firm in Beverly Hills, handling tax preparation for their biggest clients. They let me work from home, but the cut in pay was substantial. Isaiah's 401k, when it was released to me, would be enough to peel the bank off my ass temporarily, but once that was gone, my salary wouldn't cover the mortgage. Default was a possibility. Foreclosure was also a possibility. I decided not to think about it. I closed the nursery door and stumbled groggily downstairs to the kitchen, visualizing a glass of the Pinot Noir left over from the funeral. And there they were, sitting on the kitchen island. Five of them. Alone. I think I screamed. I lunged for the A block. Apples, aardvark, antelope, angel, praying it wasn't real. I ran my fingers over the hand-carved surface, considered lifting the little cube to my lips to taste the wood, convinced it was solid. I dropped the block. It clattered to a rest under the kitchen table. I took the stairs two at a time, grabbed Benjamin and my keys, snapped my son into his car seat before he was aware enough to even start crying and took off driving. Somewhere. Anywhere. We drove for hours along the empty freeway, past the 405, through the twisted, treacherous mountain road of Los Virginis, until it backed into PCH, then north. I kept my foot on the gas until I saw the Pacific Ocean. 70, 80, 85, not fast enough. I was two miles outside Carpinteria when the first streak of blue cut through the black sky, and as the darkness receded, so did the fog in my head. Benjamin had knocked out. His little head drooped on a shoulder and his pudgy lips curled into a dreamland smile. I pulled off the highway, turned around, and began the much less graceful trek back home. On the 101, somewhere around the Vineland exit, caught in a third snare of gridlock traffic, I started thinking reasonably. If the thing was going to hurt us, it would have done so already. This wasn't the first time it had inserted itself into my adult life. Two years earlier, before my son was born, I'd come home to find the same blocks. Blocks that had belonged to my dead brother, Shane. Before burning with his childhood home. On the floor of my living room, spelling out, Benjamin. Moments later, the storage unit where I'd kept my late mother's belongings caught on fire. The thing had stayed quiet since then, biding its time. My mother had been convinced it needed to be verbally invited inside to do any damage. She was wrong. I'd been very careful about who was and was not invited into my home. Isaiah swore no strangers had crossed our doorway, and I doubt the guys at Renabox Storage handed over the keys to my unit to some unknown child. Yet, the thing had no problem hanging around starting fires and leaving me messages and blocks. But if the thing meant harm to me or my son, I asked myself, why hadn't it set my house ablaze? If it could access the kitchen, why not snatch up my toddler in the dead of night? I was left with two possible answers. The thing, for some reason, couldn't actually hurt us. Or, two, the thing, for some reason 
didn't want to hurt us. 45 minutes later, I pulled into my driveway. My house was empty and untouched. The blocks were gone. I never took my in-laws up on their offer to accommodate us in Oakland. The thing found me three times. It could manage a fourth. I did, however, cultivate a more strategic mindset. I didn't intend on spending the rest of my life, and Benjamin's, constantly looking over my shoulder. The thing was playing a game with us. Games have rules. There had to be a set of rules. And if I knew exactly what I was up against, maybe I could do what my mother couldn't. Fight back. A week later, I received some minor good news. I went into Isaiah's office to sign the paperwork for his 401k and came out with a side hustle. Apparently, a new outfit was interested in buying Royal Bash Marketing, the entity I now owned a third of, but they were insisting on an audit. Isaiah's surviving partners needed someone they trusted to sort through five years' worth of disorganized invoices and receipts. It was staff accountant work, but I couldn't argue with a paycheck. I also registered for an online class through Santa Monica College. Anthropology 112. Magic, Witchcraft, and Legends. According to the syllabus, I would be learning about storytelling traditions of cultures around the world, mythology as explanation for natural phenomena, and rituals as protection against the unknown. If I was serious about finding a strategy to deter the thing, this seemed a better place to start than Conspiracies R Us on YouTube. I coughed up $200 for a hardback book as thick as a red brick called Our Stories, Ourselves. At first, nothing was helpful. We spent a couple weeks dissecting macro mythology, how the world was created, comparisons of cross-cultural pantheons of deities. Despite the fantastical subject matter, our text was extremely dry. From gods and goddesses, we progressed to Judeo-Christian demonology. I briefly considered that my family was possessed. It seemed unlikely. The possessed are traditionally animalistic, violent, and vulgar, the direct opposite of whatever was attached to me. I did drive by a Catholic church and pick up a bottle of holy water, which I sprinkled around my house. Just to make sure. When our discussion topic switched to modern folklore, which quickly turned to internet legends, I started getting somewhere. If you're reading this, I'm guessing you read my last account as well the one where I shared my mom's story. And if you read that, you probably read the comments. If you didn't, here's the summary. Eight versions of, this is fake. Three, I heard about the little boy who got killed in New Jersey in the 80s. I thought the mom did it for sure. Four ads promising a larger penis in seven days. One that proclaimed, the curse of Paddington House strikes again. What? And three individuals pegging the crime on Slender Man. Yeah, pretty useless. This time, I presented the tale to my classmates with a degree of mystique. Someone told me about this spirit that poses as kids, I typed on the discussion board. It shows up on the doorstep of other children. If the child allows it in, it kills the kid. It can create fire and make solid objects appear temporarily. Its true form is only visible if you can get a photograph of it. Anyone know what this legend is or has anyone heard the same one? I got responses an hour later. Yeah, that's the Black Eyed Kids, or B-E-K, wrote Jim Yee. I googled Black Eyed Kids. There were some similarities. The pale skin, their ability to disappear on a second glance. But that couldn't be it. Black Eyed Kids only come out at night and appear in pairs. And I definitely would have remembered if the thing's avatars, Katie and Zoe, had presented with pitch-black eyes. I opened Excel and absentmindedly entered data from a zip file of K1s, checking the comments on my class discussion board every few minutes. I read a creepy story like that when I was a kid, Kimberly Escobedo wrote. Some lady took in a homeless black cat. Like, two weeks later, the black cat disappeared and took her pet cat with it. She developed this photograph she'd taken off the two cats, and the black cat didn't show up in the picture. I didn't sleep for days. LOL, vampires don't show up in pictures either, Jesse Fuentes added, because they have no souls, so that cat didn't have a soul. 
What do we call an element of culture that is passed from person to person until it becomes universally recognizable? Professor Wells asked the class. A meme? Kimberly Escobedo replied. One of the guys, Alex Fresnel, posted a link. It was to a horror movie disturbing photoshopped picture of a girl with an elongated face, evil eyes, and overlarge teeth. There was text below in which the narrator claimed to be sharing a photo he'd taken of his neighbor's daughter. That's really creepy, Jesse commented. Also, it's weird that you can't see ghosts, but they just show up in photographs, and you can see vampires, but they don't show up in photographs. That's because ghosts have souls, but no body, Mike Nguyen explained. Vampires have bodies, but no souls. A thought occurred to me. So, if the soul is what the camera captures, I typed, then if something truly evil were to take over a body, it would show up twisted and ugly in a photo. I looked up from my laptop, pleased with my deductive reasoning. Then I saw them. Four of them. Lined up on the tile floor. Four blocks. I-170. I froze. I'd been sitting in the same spot for several hours, and those blocks definitely hadn't been there when I sat down. So if I was here, and they were there, that meant... I heard something over the baby monitor which sat on the table beside me. A cracking sound. Static-like. I didn't think. I ran through the kitchen, grabbed the first knife I saw, and threw myself up the stairs. I screamed something. I couldn't tell you what as I ran. I barged into Benjamin's room just in time to hear his first groggy wail. His bookshelf was on fire. An oversized plush Dalmatian, a gift from Isaiah's sister resting atop it, burned like a red and golden torch. I grabbed Benjamin and fled. I ran with him to the neighbor's house, pounded on their door until the wife opened it. I managed to communicate to her that my house was on fire and she must have called 911 because several minutes later a brigade of red trucks converged outside, sirens howling and lights flashing like multicolored strobes. But there was no fire to fight. My house stood as it always had. Not so much as a hint of smoky stench in the air. The firefighters milled in groups of twos and threes on my lawn. Some looked this way and that, confused and awaiting orders. One paramedic whispered something to another and his buddy laughed. The man in charge listened as I told him exactly what had happened. I'd gone to my baby's room and found his bookshelf on fire. And he agreed to come upstairs with me to look around. Once we were through the door, I returned to where I had been sitting. My laptop was on the sofa, still open. The blocks were... As I had expected, long gone. What I hadn't expected was the sight that awaited us in Benjamin's room. Benjamin's crib was untouched. His toy box and closet and chests of drawers were exactly how I'd left them. Neither his mobile nor the rocking chair stirred. But his bookcase, the one only just engulfed in flames, was gone. The wall it rested against was charred brown. The bookcase had seemingly been reduced to a small pile of ashes from which feeble wisps of smoke were emanating. A firefighter knelt and put his hand against the wall. It's still warm, he said. Benjamin and I slept in a hotel that night. By the next morning, both the char marks and the pile of ashes had completely disappeared. The firefighter had checked the rest of the house found nothing else amiss, and left. I think they thought I was looking for attention. I don't blame them. Fire isn't controlled like that. It doesn't destroy children's books on a stuffed dog and then put itself out. That day, I learned the thing wasn't scared of holy water. And that it could either create blocks and start fires from a distance, or be in my home without a body, without me realizing. And the blocks? I-170? Interstate 170? The freeway? I was mystified. The thing was many things, but cryptic had never been one of them. I was left more confused than before, the same perplexing thoughts still connecting and disconnecting in my head, entangled with the unknown meaning of I-170. Did it want me to drive along the 170 freeway? What, in the end, did it want? 
We didn't talk much about motivation in my anthropology class. Spirits are destructive, life is hard. The end. I moved Benjamin's crib into my room. I knew the thing was watching us. It had been watching as Isaiah and I cuddled on the couch, boxes still unpacked, flipping through pages of a baby name book. It might have stood over my shoulder at Isaiah's funeral or lay quietly beside me all those nights I cried myself to sleep. Maybe it loitered in the shadows of that Linwood street corner. Maybe it whispered in the ear of the drunk driver or grabbed a hold of the wheel and swerved, icily robbing my son of a father as it had robbed me. I didn't know the extent of the thing's powers, and I theorized it was holding back. Six weeks after the fire incident, Isaiah's sister, Chantel, came to town with her husband and five-year-old. She immediately offered to watch Benjamin for an afternoon. It would be her pleasure, she assured me. They were planning a second child themselves and wanted to give their daughter some practice being around a toddler. Take a mom's day off, Chantel told me. Go to the spa. How long's it been since you did anything for yourself? She was right. I'd been on my son like a tick on a dog, and I did have some errands to run and a cardboard box full of purchase receipts from 2015 to dig through. Chantel was a responsible mom. I trusted she wouldn't allow suspicious strangers around the kids. So I dropped Benjamin off with a change of clothes and his favorite stuffed dog and drove home to tackle the mountain of dirty clothes inundating my laundry room floor. Except, there was something new on my kitchen table. It wasn't blocks. It was one of Benjamin's toys. A puzzle that, when pieced together, depicted the state of California, with pictures of landmarks drawn in the appropriate places. Disneyland, Hollywood, Redwood National Forest, etc., it sat there, fully assembled. Though I hadn't so much as pulled the plastic wrap off the box, Benjamin was way too young for that toy. It had been a baby shower present from a work acquaintance. I had forgotten where I'd even put it. Just then, I remembered. I'd left it on the shelf in Benjamin's room on the bookshelf that had been reduced to a pile of ashes. I felt my pulse in my ears. My hands hung like weights at my side. I don't know how I fought the urge to run, but I fought it, and I stepped closer. Near the bottom of the puzzle map were two slashes, forming an X. That wasn't supposed to be there. The violent markings cut all the way through. The thick cardboard ribboned betraying that the knife, claws, had been dragged from left to right. X marks the spot. This X was positioned over one of the cartoony illustrations through the chipped paint. I could read the label. Vasquez Rocks. The thing wanted me to go to Vasquez Rocks. Was this the meaning of I-70? I was supposed to drive to an overfilmed tourist trap to... What? Meet the thing? The thought dropped like a trapdoor in the pit of my stomach, but I wasn't going to spend the rest of my life running. Benjamin wasn't going to spend the rest of his life scared. I called Chantel, and was assured my son had fallen asleep in her daughter's lap as the family watched Finding Nemo together. And then I scooped up my car keys and headed for the highway. I veered left when the 134 freeway split away from that 170 turnoff. I noticed that the 170 wasn't even an interstate freeway. Eventually, I approached jutting rock formations silhouetted against deep blue twilight. By the time I parked alongside the weeded entrance to Vasquez Rocks, it was nearly night. I'd been hiking there, once, with some college girlfriends. Even during the day, the place was eerie. If you looked past burnt gold weeds and an occasional critter, Vasquez Rocks could be the surface of Mars. I stood at the entrance for what felt like hours, waiting for the thing, waiting for directions. Then the clouds shifted, and by the icy, pale moonlight, I saw the blocks. The first one, E, eagle, eggplant, elephant, eggs, 
rested against a small tuft of grass about ten yards in front of me. I scrambled to pick it up. Once I did, I noticed the second block, one of the blank ones, a short distance from the first. I double-checked to make sure my pocket knife, pepper spray, and rock salt were in my purse, then continued along the thing's breadcrumb trail. It took a while. I hiked across dusty flatland, up and down small hills around shallow caves. In my head, I kept count. Seventeen blocks, eighteen, nineteen. Several times I was sure I'd lost my way, only to see the next block half buried in a shallow crater or positioned at the top of a rock formation. Twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one. I found the fortieth block, J, Jaguar, Jellyfish, Juniper, Jackrabbit, bathed in moonlight at the top of a gently sloped, flat-topped hill. On the hill was a house. It was a large house and a beautiful one. Moss-drenched red brick walls, grand Palladian architecture with an angular roof, shaded porches, and white Grecian columns. It reminded me of a set piece from Gone with the Wind. Nobody in California lived in a house like this. I don't think anyone anywhere owned a house like this anymore. The front door was wide open. In retrospect, I ignored a whole lot of weird... I should have wondered what a large mansion was doing in the middle of a national park. I should have found it strange I hadn't seen its outline as I approached. That it had appeared basically out of nowhere. But I didn't. I was drowning in a sea of weird and working off the logic that only works in dreams. There's a house there. The door is open. So I must go inside. I found myself in a magnificent parlor room. The neoclassical theme matched that of the exterior. Doorways were butressed by wood-carved columns, ornate flowers, and swirls framed the windows and large stone fireplace. And the walls were painted a rich blue that complemented the dark stained hardwood floors and spiral staircase. China figures sat on display in a buffed cabinet, and a large brass chandelier hung from the ceiling lit candles sweating wax. I didn't know what to make of it. This house looked like an exhibit in a museum. Except, lived in. The velvet sofa covers were wrinkled as if recently occupied. A painted teapot sat on the coffee table flanked by two teacups. I stepped closer and saw that one of the cups still had tea inside. There was a plate of half-eaten finger sandwiches. From there, I proceeded through a doorframe, which led into a curved alcove and then a palatial dining room with a long table. The scene was lit by a series of gas lanterns hanging from the walls. I assumed there was food, though I couldn't have told you what they were all eating, because I only saw the bodies. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. Before that moment, I didn't truly understand what it meant to be frozen in fear. There were thirty of them, at least, all dressed in period clothes, the women wearing frilly gowns with hoop skirts, the men in button-down shirts and tailored jackets, the servants with lacy caps and black frocks. They hung off chairs, hunched over their plates, sprawled across the floor. A young girl's lily-white hand reached out for me, A small rivulet of blood pooled around the extended extremity, staining the lace cuffs of her dress and oxidizing her gold rings. I guess the head that lolled to my left, swollen tongue hanging out, delicate young features distorted, ice-blonde ringlets tangled around a dislodged spinal column, was hers. As was the decapitated body leaning back in its chair like a sleeping student, mangled arm at its side, ripped muscle tissue drooping like flaccid streamers exposed at the stump of a right wrist. There were chests torn open, spilling bowels and ribs and hearts dangling from severed vessels, heads hanging upside down off folded skin and muscles, naked vertebra popping out of stubbed necks like grotesque puppets. Arms, legs, hands, feet, and heads, tossed about like broken extremities of discarded dolls. 
I felt hot liquid bubbling in my throat. I turned away and lurched, puking, my vomit mixing with the puddle of blood draining from the girl's disembodied, beckoning hand. I turned and ran, back the way I came, back through the quaint, historic, empty parlor. Except it wasn't empty anymore. There were bodies in a pile on the sofa. A woman lay face down midway up the stairs. There were several steps between her legs and her torso. I swallowed a second wave of vomit and looked only toward the open door. A body lay in my way. It was a middle-aged man, face up. Even in death, his wide blue eyes betrayed unimaginable horror. His nose was large and bent. There was a pink birthmark under his right eye, and his mouth twisted in one final scream. He bore no injuries to his front, but if I had to guess, I'd say the slimy gossamer sacks on his chest were his removed lungs. He'd died running. I thought he'd been attacked from behind. He was killed last. I jumped over him, clenched my eyes shut, and stumbled out the door. I opened my eyes. I wasn't back on the plateau. My surroundings were dim and brown, lit by a single gas lamp. I stood in a small dwelling on a dirt floor, in stark contrast to the mansion I'd previously encountered. This home bore the countenance of abject poverty. The only furniture visible were a rotting wooden table and a single pallet bed with a leaking straw mattress. Despite their vast differences, the hovel and the mansion had one thing in common. Three bodies were piled on the bed. Rivers of blood ran down her legs, her face so badly bruised I could barely distinguish features. The second girl, maybe 18, was similarly disfigured, with the addition of a deep laceration from her rib cage to her pelvis, spilling bowels onto the bare legs of the third woman. This one was older, in her late thirties, sporting a nearly decapitating gash across her throat. I choked and stumbled backwards into a crude wooden table. No, I couldn't bear but I looked anyways. Two more bodies lingered at the table, one folded on the ground and another lying supine on top. I couldn't see much of the body on the floor, and I had no desire to. I stepped closer to view the body on the table. I immediately determined how he had met his untimely end. Dark blood leaked from the cut across his neck, trailing down his chest like a breastplate. But unlike the others who died where they'd fallen... This corpse looked specifically placed. Blood had been smoothed across his closed eyelids. Lines and circles were painted on his cheeks and his chest was covered in what I'd guess were words, but not words written in any written language I had ever seen. Finally, my eyes rested on a seventh corpse. This one was a grown man dressed in a stained work shirt and torn slacks sitting upright in a chair in the shadows. At the far wall of the dwelling, I guessed he was the father of the murdered children. He was dead as well, but dead in a completely different manner. I saw the bloody hole in his temple and the pistol on the dirt floor, fallen from his limp hand. I turned away from him, back to the little boy on the table. Strange, he looked almost peaceful. If I hadn't known better... I'd have said he was smiling. He'd been a cute kid, too, with a square jaw and a head full of dark frizz. And then his eyes snapped open. I cried out. The kid was alive. He pulled himself into a sitting position on the table, hole in his neck gaping like a screwed-up cartoon. He stared at me, big eyes wide and mirthful, grinning. Hi, Felicia, he chirped joyfully. Do you like my work? And with that, he hopped off the table and sauntered out the door. And then the house collapsed. 
The walls melted into ash like butter in a pan. I was lost in a sea of gray, eyes burning, throat tight, air around me hot and oppressive. I couldn't breathe. I coughed as I ran, eyes closed, arms flailing wildly until I fell to my knees and curled into myself, shaking and crying and praying for help. I don't know how long I stayed like that. It wasn't until I realized that the air had cooled and I'd cried the dust out of my eyes. I sat upright and found myself atop an empty hill, surrounded by white ash that rested on the dirt and low shrubs like melting snow. As I stared at the golden city lights in the distance, I saw the whiteness receding, dissipating into nothingness, leaving the terrain as though untouched. Utterly confused as to what I had just experienced, I pulled myself to my feet, my toe connected with something small and hard. I looked down. It was a human skull. Child-sized. Under any other circumstances, I would have been terrified, but after what I'd just experienced, the presence of the tiny skull was almost anticlimactic. I knelt beside the bizarre object and examined it. It looked as though it had been exposed to the elements for years. I don't know how I made it back to my car that night. My trail of blocks had vanished and I'd been led deep into the park. But finally, thighs aching, drenched in sweat, I pried open my driver's side door and sank into the seat, unsure of what to do next. Call child services? Report a five-year-old running around Vasquez Rocks, blood smeared across his face like war paint, throat cut from ear to ear. Call the cops and report a vanishing house, serving as a ghostly tomb for thirty-aught dismembered bodies? No. The thing brought me here for a reason. I'd seen what it wanted me to see. And history, both mine and my mother's, dictated the thing could run rings around authority figures. Panicking, I called Chantel's number. She didn't answer. I closed the door and stuck my keys in the ignition, inadvertently glancing in the rearview mirror. There was a sickly white figure sitting in the back seat. I screamed and groped for the door handle. In the process, I got a better view of my new traveling companion, and I almost felt stupid. It was just Benjamin's oversized stuffed Dalmatian. Benjamin's oversized stuffed Dalmatian which I had last seen on top of the bookcase, functioning as a candle. And then it hit me. It hit me in the face so hard, I started laughing. Why had I not figured this out before? The thing could start fires. It could also recreate things that had been burned. The blocks, the puzzle... The stuffed dog, the photograph of Shane I'd come across when I was 14, the horrifying half-charred picture I'd discovered in my mother's destroyed storage unit, all had been incinerated, then reformed from ash. But these burned objects couldn't retain their form forever. After a certain amount of time, they'd revert back to their true properties and disintegrate into dust. Which meant that the mansion, and the one-roomed cabin, and the dozens of bodies... Do you like my work? The thing always took the form of a child. I knew the little boy with the cut throat was my childhood nightmare, wearing a new costume. And I knew what it was capable of. My odometer hit 80 on the freeway long before I realized I'd forgotten to turn my lights on. I called Chantal eight times. Each time I heard her cheery message recording, I breathed faster and gripped the wheel harder. Why had I left Benjamin alone? How could I take my eyes off my child for a second, knowing what kind of monster stalked him? I peeled into the driveway of Chantel's mother-in-law's house, where her family was staying, ten minutes to one. I pounded on the door like a madwoman. When fists weren't loud enough, I took to kicking and yelling at the top of my lungs. No one answered. Fresh sweat running down my face, anguished warmth spreading from my chest to my extremities. I fought to keep the possibilities from my... The door clicked open. And suddenly, I was face to face with Chantal's husband, Brian, bedheaded and bleary-eyed. 
I was immediately embarrassed. A feeling augmented when I saw he was holding a baseball bat in his right hand. Fuck Felicia, he mumbled. He scared the shit out of Chantel. I'm sorry, I said meekly. I... Is Benjamin asleep? He nodded and shuffled back down the hall, revealing a disconcerted-looking Chantel, hair in rollers, a squirming Benjamin in her arms. They were surprisingly nice about being woken up in the middle of the night. Chantel's phone had been on silent, which is why she wasn't answering. I don't know why I hadn't assumed that this was the case. I made up a story about falling asleep on my couch, sheepishly collected my son, apologized once more to Chantel, and got out of there as quickly as possible. It was nearly two in the morning when I pulled into my driveway. My house was dark, and my chest tightened at the thought of entering. This would forever be my life, I realized. I was prey. Benjamin was prey. Prey of an omnipotent creature that could transcend the boundaries of space and time, capable of violent mass murder and fiery destruction, but enjoyed playing with its food, torturing and terrifying us until... As I pulled Benjamin out of the car, I tripped the sensor. The outside lights came on. There was a white girl sitting on the porch, looking at me expectantly. Not a girl. A young woman. Maybe five years younger than me. She had pale skin and long, wavy red hair. She wore black jeans and a red t-shirt. I thought her eyes were blue. She may have had freckles. She stood up and smiled at me. She had a very big, very pretty smile. Um, Felicia, I'm Kira. Can, um, can I come in so we can talk? She extended her hand, still smiling that Disney princess smile. I felt the blood drain from my face. My brain screamed run, but my legs were numb. It had preyed on all my fears all night, and now the thing was making its move. I backed up slowly, Benjamin clutched tight in my arms. The red-haired girl was two meters away when instinct kicked in. I whirled, half-tossed Benjamin into the back seat, slammed the door shut. Not thinking, not looking, I reached in my purse and pawed for something hard. Please, the girl continued. She was leaning on the driver's side window now. Her smile, close up, seemed menacing. Can I talk to you? I know something I really think you should know. I found my pepper spray. In one movement, I dropped my purse, flicked back the cap, and pressed the trigger. The girl hollered violently and dropped to the ground. I nudged her out of the way and pulled open the car door, smacking her in the face. Fuck! Are you kidding me? Stay away from my kid! I screamed at her, climbing into the car. I tried to pull the door shut, but she clutched the frame. I reared back my foot to kick her. She reeled. Don't! I hesitated. Blinking maniacally, she rubbed her swollen eyes. Th that monster that's after you! <laughs> she stammered. It's after me, too! Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. It really helps me out whenever you guys do things like listen or watch. And it really helps if you guys also subscribe to the podcast or subscribe to the YouTube channel or do things like clicking the bell or clicking the like button. Also, it's becoming allergy season <laughs> and it's affecting me in case you couldn't tell. Well, I have one thing that actually does help me out, and that's the help from my wife's tea. My wife makes tea and sells it online at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. If you guys want to test some for yourself, then head over to the shop, get yourself some of the Dark and Stormy Night, which is my personal favorite, and ask for the dabbing Mr. Creepypasta sticker. And as always, I want to give a very special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the ones who help me keep the lights on the house, as well as allow me to do things like commission brand new stories. In case you guys haven't noticed, we hit that tier. So, a very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stricken, Chase Burnett, Deanna Kraus, G Weevil 3, Tristan Pelton, 1 800 Nightmare, Acid System, Aaron Stormcrow, Azarine Fox, Bobby Carmen, Chris Lovin, Cryptic Nightmares, The Doctor, Daniel Polson, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Euro Gore, Freddy Krueger, Fried Chicken 12, Hades Nephew, Infertile One, James Bruce, James Lowe, 
Jason VR Wilson, Jimbo the Hutt, Jordan Nels, Jordan Johnson, Caleb Dougal, Kiri the Sloth, Legit Quad Feed, Liam Newman, Lisa Cottrell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Michael Scarborough, Nico Kyle, Nina Smith, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Rafael Rodriguez, Robert White, S Man, Sky Harbor, Snails Burnett, Talon Carlick, The Ginger Bros, Trace Miles, Suji Campbell, Tiny, Unknown Nobody, Andre Garcia, Brianna Wright, Brian Ace, Caspian, Hogunkji, and Someone You Love. And also a very special thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. All you guys who are listed as Patreons and everybody who's even supporting for just $1, I really love and appreciate you guys. And if you want to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Even a dollar a month, honestly, it keeps the show going. So thank you guys so much. And to everyone out there, sweet dreams. <laughs>